Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's AP Chemistry Podcast. The focus today, buffers. Buffers are a major topic in AP Chemistry, and they're studied extensively in first-year college-level chemistry courses and in nursing courses. So the first thing I'd like to accomplish in this webcast is to introduce the concept of a buffer, the components of a buffer, what they're made of, why they're important to us. We'll use picture models to help explore this idea. And then we'll talk about how buffers are affected if you add small amounts of strong acids or bases to the buffer system. We'll use the picture models to explore this. We'll do it in terms of the chemical equations as well. And we'll also talk about the idea of buffer capacity. And then we're going to go on and do some calculations. How does the pH change in a buffer system if you add some strong acid or base, since that's the whole purpose of buffers anyway? It's a fairly involved calculation, but I know you're up for it. Let's jump right in and start with the definitions. When we're talking about a buffer, usually we're preparing an aqueous solution. And this aqueous solution needs to contain two things, a weak acid and an ionic compound, uh, a salt, that contains the conjugate base of the weak acid as the anion. Well, that's one way to make a buffer. For example, we might use acetic acid, which is a weak acid, and then add sodium acetate to the solution. So the common ion here is acetate. And if you're familiar with common ion equilibria, really, that's what we're dealing with in terms of buffers. Let's look at this in terms of a picture model. I need my weak acid, acetic acid, which is shown here with the triangle and the little blue dot. It's a weak acid, and we know that that means that less than 5% of the molecules dissociate. I have not shown that here in this picture model because it would be too hard to do on the scale uh, that I've got here. So that's my weak acid. I also need to have the conjugate base, right? I have to have the salt of its conjugate base, which here is sodium acetate. The really important part here is the acetate ion. That's the conjugate base here, just the triangle. Uh, it is an ion, so I have to have a counter ion to uh, support that. That would be the sodium ion. The sodium ion is really a spectator here. Now, if you go ahead and look at this picture model and count on the screen, there are five molecules of undissociated acetic acid. I added in five formula units of sodium acetate. So I have five acetate ions, and I needed to have five sodium ions as well. Remember, the sodium ions are a spectator. But I've got the components of a buffer, the weak acid, its conjugate base. I set this particular buffer picture up so that the concentration of the weak acid, HA, is equal to the concentration of its conjugate base, which I'm calling A minus. Remember, it's the anion that the acid forms when it dissociates. So I chose here to set them up to be equal. That's not the requirement. The requirement is that they're both present in the solution. Now another way we can prepare a buffer is to take a solution of a weak base and then to add an ionic compound, a salt, that contains its conjugate acid as the cation. For example, we might take an ammonia solution and add in some ammonium nitrate, and that would also make a buffer. Let's look at a picture model of that. I've got my neutral ammonia molecules, all right, and again, I have five of them. You can count those on the screen. And I have to add in its conjugate acid as a salt, as an ionic compound. That would be ammonium nit nitrate in this particular case. So I have my ammonium ions, which are charged, and then I have to have nitrate ions as the counter ion. Again, the nitrate is a spectator here. As before, I chose to set this buffer up so that the concentration of my weak base is equal to my concentration of the conjugate acid. Not because that's a requirement, but because that's what I chose to do here. Okay, so let's talk about why we care about buffers. A buffer, of course, is made from a weak acid and its conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. Both an acid and a base are present in their conjugate pairs. Because of this, buffer solutions resist pH changes. That's the hallmark of a buffer. That's really the important thing you need to realize about buffer behavior. If you add an outside source of an acid or a base to the buffer solution, the pH will not change much. It will change a little bit, but it won't change by very much at all. And that's a really important thing. There's a buffer system in your blood whose job it is to keep your blood pH at 7.4. If your blood pH gets too high or too low, there are serious, serious health consequences. So it's important biologically that you understand how buffers work. So let's go on and talk about what happens to a buffer if you add a strong acid. I'm going to work here with my 
picture model of the acetate ion. And let's pretend that we're going to add some hydrochloric acid. It's a strong acid, and of course it's really the hydrogen ion that we care about, the H+. Now the hydrogen ion is going to react with the acetate ion of the buffer. And I'm going to end up changing my buffer ratios. So if we go on and look at this, I'm adding in HCl. Let's add in one formula unit of HCl. So I've got one H+. Plus. It's going to react with one acetate ion. That's what I'm trying to highlight here. All right, acetate ion is the conjugate base in the buffer. The H plus for my strong acid is going to react with it in a one-to-one -one ratio. And I'm going to make the weak acid molecule, my acetic acid molecule. And now if I go through and count again, I have now six acetic acid molecules and only four acetate ions. So I've changed my concentration, all right, my ratios of HA, of the weak acid, and the conjugate base. I now have more weak acid than conjugate base. So I've played with that ratio a little bit, which is going to affect the pH. We did it with picture models. Now let's do it with equations. All right, I'm adding H+. Plus. We know that it's going to react with acetate ion. 1H+, plus is going to react with 1 acetate to form 1 acetic acid molecule. Okay, and that's what we showed in the picture models as well. So every mole of acid that I add is going to react with an equal number of moles of the conjugate base and make equal numbers of moles more of that weak acid in the buffer system. The net effect of all of this, the pH is going to go down. I added some acid. The pH is going to go down, but it's going to be a very small change in pH, much smaller than if I had added that same amount of acid to a non-buffered solution. Let's go on and talk about what happens if we add a strong base to the buffer. Again, we'll do this with the acetate buffer, but it would be true if we did the same thing with the ammonia buffer as well. All right, so in this case, I'm adding sodium hydroxide. It's really the hydroxide ion that we're worried about here. And that hydroxide ion is going to react with an acetic acid molecule to form acetate ion and water. Let's look at this with the picture models. All right, I'm adding sodium hydroxide. They're in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's really the hydroxide ion that matters here. The sodium ion is just another spectator. And the hydroxide ion is going to react with an acetic acid molecule. And I'm going to make an acetate ion and water. Now I've left out all the other water molecules for clarity, but of course that's what's happening. They're reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio. So now, because I've added the hydroxide, now I have more conjugate base acetate ion than I have of the weak acid. So again, I've manipulated that ratio, but I still have both components. Let's look at this again from an equation standpoint. Each ion of the hydroxide ion that I add is going to react with one molecule of the acetic acid. So on a one-to-one -one ratio, on a mole ratio, I'll make one acetate and one water. So for, you know, on a mole basis, all the hydroxide that I, that I add is going to react with an equal number of moles of acetic acid until the acetic acid is all gone. And I'm going to make more acetate ion, one to one to one mole ratio. The net effect, I did add hydroxide. The pH is going to go up, but only a small amount. Again, it's a much smaller pH change than if I had added an equal number of moles of hydroxide ion to an unbuffered solution. Great. So when you're doing calculations involving buffers, you should always start with a balanced equation. These are equilibrium problems. It may not feel like an equilibrium problem to you at this time, but it really is. And of course, your buffer does contain a weak acid. So one way to do this is to start with a generic weak acid. You almost don't need to know the formula of the weak acid. As long as you know it's a monoprotic weak acid, it can take the general form HA. And of course, we know that an acid in water is going to donate an H plus to H2O, you're going to form hydronium ion and A minus. Now, it's a weak acid. This isn't going to happen extensively, but it is going to occur in water. So we've got our balanced equation. And once you have a balanced equation, you can write an equilibrium constant expression. We'll call it a Ka because it's for a weak acid. All right, again, just reminding you, um, A minus is what I'm calling the conjugate base. It's the anion that the, the weak acid forms. HA is my term here for the undissociated weak acid. I'm being very generic. If you knew the formula of the acid, you could easily substitute that in. Once we've got that, we can write our Ka expression. 
So it's the hydronium ion concentration times the A minus concentration over the original concentration of the undissociated weak acid. Okay, so, you know, we work with equilibrium constants a lot in this course. Once you've got that balanced equation, you've got this. And it's also on your formula sheet for the AP exam. I find it's very helpful when I'm doing buffer problems to rearrange my Ka expression to really focus in on the hydronium ion concentration. When I do that, it gets, takes this form. I'll have, right, I'll have done this isolated the hydronium ion concentration. There are a lot of different ways to approach buffer problems. This is not the only way. It's one way that I find works very well and students can keep track of everything. So I find this to be very helpful. But if you want to use Henderson Hasselbeck or other methods, more power to you, okay? You should get to the same answer. So, you might remember in the picture models that I developed for you, I had set it up so that the concentration of the weak acid was equal to the concentration of the conjugate base. We can write similar expressions for basic buffers um, involving hydroxide ion concentration. Um, but if they're equal as they were in the buffer system that we had used in the picture models, that term is one which means that the hydronium ion concentration in that case would equal Ka. Now this isn't universally true, it's only true when those two concentrations are equal. If I take the negative log of both sides, then I get pH equals pKa for that buffer at that system. So that can be a helpful thing as well. So let's go on and do a problem. I promised you a problem, here it is. A buffer is made by adding 0.200 moles of acetic acid and 0.200 moles of sodium acetate, so it's an acetate buffer, to enough water to make 1.00 liters of solution. You do need to know that final volume. The pH of the buffer is 4.74 before we do anything to it. Calculate the pH of the solution after 0.050 moles of sodium hydroxide is added. Okay, so we've got a buffer. We know moles and volumes, so we, can, we know molarities. In one liter, that makes it very easy. We're given the initial pH of the buffer, calculate the pH. Okay, I think I've got a game plan here. Um, I'm, I'm noticing one thing that's interesting about this problem. Um, don't we need a Ka value? There's no Ka value given. How can we do a buffer problem without a Ka value? Well, you've got two options. So you can go look it up in your textbook, online, or actually we were given enough information in this problem to find it. So we're going to do that because that's what I feel like doing. Um, we were told that the uh, we had 0.2 moles of acetic acid, 0.2 moles of sodium acetate in one liter. So we know that the initial concentrations of the acid and its conjugate base were equal. And that means that the hydronium ion concentration equals the Ka. We had just developed that, so we've got that. Well, I wasn't given the hydronium ion concentration, but I was given the pH. So I can say, well, but I can calculate the hydronium ion concentration from the pH. Let's go ahead and do that. And then that answer, which turns out to be 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth molar, is numerically equal to the equilibrium constant, the Ka. So we weren't given the Ka, but we were able to find it. Um, I'm not saying that you need to be able to do this. Um, on the other hand, it never hurts to be exposed to more involved strategies. Okay, so now we've got a Ka value. Let's go on. The next thing that trips students up with these problems is that there's actually a stoichiometry piece to this, as well as the equilibrium calculation. I'm adding hydroxide. It's going to react with the weak acid to make the conjugate base and water. So I need to calculate how much of my original weak acid is left after I've added my hydroxide. I need to calculate how much total conjugate base I have after I've added the hydroxide, and then Calculate my new H plus, and from that I can find the pH. Not tremendously difficult, but you have to remember that there's that stoichiometry piece before you can go on. That's really what an ice table is doing for you, by the way, is a stoichiometry approach to what's going on. So, we know the moles of hydroxide added will consume an equal number of moles of acetic acid. Remember those equations? It was one to one to one. Okay, so if I started with 0.2 moles initially, of the acetic acid. I'm going to use up 0.05 moles of it because it's reacting with the hydroxide. So that means 0.150 moles of acetic acid are remaining. We're going to assume that the volume is still approximately one liter. 
whatever the volume is, it's going to be the same for both components. So it will end up not being a big deal. Um, so it's all from those one-to-one -one mole ratios from the balanced equation. We have to do the same thing to find out, same kind of thing, to find out the moles of acetate ion present. All right. So however many moles of hydroxide ion that I added, I'm going to end up making that many more moles of uh, acetate ion. So I started with 0.2 moles of acetate ion. I end up creating another 0.05 moles for a total of 0.25 moles of acetate ion in the final solution, which we're assuming is still about one liter. All right. Again, this is coming from the, those equations showing the hydroxide reacting with the conjugate with the weak acid to make the conjugate base, all in one to one to one mole ratios. So now that we have these, we have the Ka, we have the weak acid concentration, we have the conjugate base concentration. So we can substitute those in to our rearranged Ka expression and solve for the hydronium ion concentration, which comes out to be 1.08 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. Okay, so from that, well, we know that the pH is the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. Um, we only know the hydronium ion concentration really to two sig figs, even though I've written down three. We'll take care of that at the end. And then, so we just substitute and evaluate and I get a pH of 4.97. Since I really did only know the hydronium ion concentration to two sig figs, I'm allowed to have two sig figs after my decimal. Okay, so the final answer, the pH is 4.97. It would have been a much more drastic change. Had I added 0.05 moles of sodium hydroxide to say a sodium chloride solution. Two other things I wanted to mention very briefly, buffer range. Buffers work best in a pH range plus or minus one from the pKa value of the weak acid. A pKa is the negative log of the Ka value. All right, so the exponent part of the Ka value gives you the clue as to the optimal pH range for that buffer. All right, so if your weak acid has a Ka value of, let's say, one times 10 to the minus four, that buffer is going to work best in a pH range of three to five. So the exponent part of the Ka value really gives you, tells you where the buffer will be most effective. That's your quick and dirty back of the envelope way of figuring that out. The other thing I wanted to mention was the idea of buffer capacity. Remember we had 0.2 moles of each component in our buffer problem that we just did? All right. If I add too much strong acid, I'm going to use up all the conjugate base. If I add too much strong base, I'm going to use up all of my conjugate acid. So that really is what tells you the buffer capacity. In the problem we just did, if we had added 0.2 moles of sodium hydroxide, I would have used up all the acetic acid and made, turned it all into acetate ion. If there's no acetic acid, it's not a buffer anymore. All right. If I had added 0.2 moles of a strong acid, HCl, to the buffer system that we talked about in that problem, I would have used up all of the acetate ion and turned it all into weak acid, and there would have been no other source of acetate ion, so it's not a buffer. So the idea of buffer capacity really uh, depends on how many moles of the weak acid and conjugate base were used to prepare the buffer system initially. But if you exceed it, the buffer won't work. Great. We'll stop here for today.